let's take a look at who are these Babylonians who invented Sour Cycle. Babylonians are descendants of Sumeria, the first modern human civilization 6,000 years ago, earlier than ancient Egypt. It's located in Mesopotamia, or modern-day Syria and Iraq, the birthplace of Abraham, the father of three religions, Hebrew, Christian, and Islam. It's the cradle of civilization. Their inventions and achievements are still used today. Astronomy, irrigation, architecture, mathematics, politics, code of law, urban planning, almost everything except internet and cable TV. They are very smart people. Their alphabets, cuneiform, consist of 400 characters, not 26 characters ABCD like us. Their numeral system is sexagesimal or base 60, not base 10 like us. Sexagesimal is very good for counting big numbers and small numbers still used today for measuring time, angles, and geographic coordinates. They are the one who invented 360 degrees in a circle. Do you know why they are 660 degrees in a circle? It's the average days of the sun and the moon circling the earth in a year. The sun is circling the earth in 365.2425 days. And the moon is circling the earth in 354.3829 days. At those numbers, you will get 719.61 days. So the average of lunar and solar days in a year is 359.8 days, rounding to 360 days. That's where the Babylonians got the idea of 360 degrees in a circle and got sexagesimal numeric system base 60. It's really natural science. They are the one who invented lunar calendar, synodic month, the real astronomical event. The beginning and ending of each month is based on moon phases, hence the name month. That's natural science. On the other hand, modern day solar calendar system is based on nothing. If you want to make solar calendar based on natural phenomena, the new year should be either summer June 22nd, autumn September 23rd, winter December 22nd, or spring March 21st. But solar calendar starts with January the 1st, which means nothing and ends with December 31st, which also means nothing. It's not really solar calendar, and every date of the month has nothing to do with the moon. You're using a raw calendar system. Yet, Babylonians were aware of solar cycle too. So they invented the so-called lunisolar calendar. Its lunar calendar consists of 12 months, the closest lunar cycle with solar cycle in a year. They are the one who invented 7 days in a week. They observed the stars are moving in the same directions and the same speed, except there are seven sky objects that move differently. They call it the seven wandering stars. Later, by the ancient Greeks, it's called planets. That's the origin of the word planet. Planet is not a ball that living creature can live on it like you always see in CGI cartoons published by NASA. Planet is a wandering star, a star which has its own path and speed circling the Earth. Those seven wandering stars or seven planets of the Earth are the Sun, the Moon, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus, and Saturn. Then Babylonians devoted seven days every week to honor those seven wandering stars. The first day to honor the Sun, hence the name Sunday. Second day to honor the Moon, Monday. Third day is for Mars, or in Nordic is called Tyr, Tuesday. Fourth day for Mercury, Mercury in French. In German and Dutch is called Odin or Woden. Wednesday, fifth day for Jupiter, Hueves in Spanish, is Nordic god Thor, Thursday, sixth day to honor Venus, Viernes in Spanish, is Nordic god of Frigg, Friday, the seventh day to honor Saturn, Saturday. That's the influence of Babylonian culture, we still use it until now. Babylonians are the ones who invented the concept of clock, the sundial. Then they divided a day by 12 hours daytime and 12 hours nighttime. Where did they get the number 12? Of course, it's the 12 zodiac constellations in a year. And it takes 12 lunar cycles or months for the sun to return to its original position. Like every other celestial body circling the earth in a certain cycle, Babylonians observed that solar and lunar eclipses happen in a cycle of 18 years, 11 days, and 8 hours. That's the only way to predict eclipses. Nothing to do with heliocentric speeds and distances. Babylonians were using lunar calendar. 
They knew that solar eclipses always happen in new moon and lunar eclipses always happen in full moon. They knew well that during solar eclipses, the moon's position is at the nearest point to the sun. Yet, they never thought it's the moon that eclipsing the sun. This is very interesting. Since kids, we've been told and educated in schools that solar eclipses are caused by the moon and moon eclipses are caused by the ball Earth's shadow. A theory without any single proof, but taught in schools like a fact. Babylonians, however, observed the sky much more often and more careful than us. They didn't have internet and cable TV or social media to chat. They had the luxury of time to live in harmony with nature. Why didn't they think it's the moon that eclipsing the sun? First, because they knew there are so many unseen celestial bodies in the sky. Second, because they knew the moon is behind the sun. If the moon is in front of the sun, you would see the moon is getting close to the sun before eclipses, right? But you never see it. Let's use our logics here. Why can't you see the stars during daytime? Because the sun is too bright, right? And because the stars are behind the sun, there is no star between the sun and the earth even according to heliocentrism. All stars are behind the sun, the sun is very bright at daytime, therefore you can't see the stars during daytime. But the moon is 400 times closer than the sun, according to heliocentrism. The moon is between the earth and the sun when it's new moon, and it's behind the earth when it's full moon. Sometimes you can see the moon very clear in the morning. So why can't you see the moon when it's new moon? Because the sun is too bright? Hell no! You can see every single object in front of the sun during daytime. You can see the clouds, airplanes, birds, etc. Sometimes you can see the moon in the sunlight. So why can't you see the moon when it's new moon? because the moon is in unseen position? No, it's not correct either. Even in heliocentrism, the moon is near the sun during the new moon. So why you never see the moon where is new moon? Because the moon is behind the sun at the time of the new moon. Third, Babylonians who invented star cycle never thought the sun is eclipsed by the moon because they knew the moon's body can't eclipse the sun. Ancient people were aware of many unidentified celestial bodies that sometimes can be seen with naked eyes. Only a dark celestial body can eclipse the sun out of nowhere. Just like lunar eclipses are caused by other celestial bodies, so are solar eclipses. Babylonians called it the planet of crossing, planet X, dark sun if you will. And so do every cultures in the world. In India, they call it Rahu and Ketu. In Java, Indonesia, they call it Batara Kala. Not because ancient people are stupid, but because they really use their senses. Their senses told them it's not the moon eclipsing the sun, it's a dark sky object that can absorb light. And it's not the Earth's shadow that eclipses the moon either. It's a similar dark sky object. And you know what? They didn't just make theories. They calculated the cycle of these dark objects, so accurate we still use today, star cycle. On the other hand, you don't use your own eyes and your own senses. You just follow what NASA told you.
If we're discussing about theories, it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to have differences. It won't cost you money if flat earth is wrong. On personal level, it doesn't matter whether you believe the earth is square or triangle. It only matters in social level. There will be blood in the water Because if heliocentric model is wrong, that means there are trillion dollar scandal in the last 60 years. That means space programs and satellites are hoax. Your communication costs should not be this high. Your national debt should not be that high. Most people don't realize or don't want to realize about their national debts. The world owes 68.7 trillion dollars. Do you know how much money in circulation in the whole world? You have to look at the physical currency, the most liquid asset class of which all central banks pay attention. It's only 7.6 trillion dollars. The world owes 68.7 trillion dollars while the world only has 7.6 trillion dollars. It's a debt you can never pay, ever. To whom the world owes that much? 99% people in the world owes to the 1% population, the global elites. If you still don't believe the global elites exist, you better listen to the Minister of Finance of Indonesia, a very smart and charming lady, former managing director of the World Bank Group. Kalau di dunia lebih timpang lagi, 1% orang kaya di dunia menguasai 90% aset dunia itu. How come a very small group of people can make the others owe to them without even knowing it? because they have rigged the systems to benefit themselves at the expense of most people on earth. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. Central banks in the US and Europe are privately owned corporations with the monopoly on creating money but with no accountability. Those financial elites control all central banks in the world through the World Bank, IMF and their elite financial agents. The system is quite simple. All countries in the world have to face budget deficits every year. Then all governments have to issue bonds. Then the financial elites finance the bonds by creating money from thin air because they have monopoly on creating money. Then all governments collect taxes from the people to pay the interest. Next year, all governments face deficit again and the never-ending cycle continues. The global elites have to create deficits in all national budgets. The biggest four deficit makers are wars, terrorism, financial crisis bailouts, and space program hoax, including satellite hoax. Those are the parasites that eat your stomach from the inside. That's what you have to pay from your taxes. Globe Earth hoax is the weakest link in their systems. You hit it right, the whole system will collapse. Meanwhile, flat earth awakening gets the momentum all over the world. Indonesia is still the number one flat earth topic in the world, according to Google Trends. People gather by themselves and made the flat earth 1-1 community. It's from the grassroots, bottom up. I didn't create them. Imagine there's no heaven. On September 23rd, when the sun has its culmination at the equator in Pontianak, Indonesia, Flat Earth 11 community in all 34 provinces made a national movement to measure the sun distance in different locations. People from neighboring countries, Singapore, Malaysia, and Australia also participated in this event. Imagine all the people. The result of this research has been presented in scientific journal format. It isn't hard to do. On October 28, FE11 community made the second national movement. People in 34 provinces turned on mini Tesla coil wireless lamp. Imagine all the people. Living life in peace 
For our one one community who participated in this awesome national movement, thank you very much for your contribution. God bless you all. May God be with all of us. It's not only about energy saving, but it's a symbol of hope. Nothing to kill or die for, and no there are many technologies that can save your money, but suppressed by the global elites. Imagine all the people. You're not supposed to live in a world with expensive electricity, expensive gasoline, expensive telecommunication using satellite scam. You may say I'm a dreamer. You're not supposed to live in violent wars and terrorism designed by the elites to make your national budgets face deficits. You're not supposed to be industrial slaves, stressful life to pay your bills, and pay taxes to repay debts to super wealthy financial elites that have the monopoly on printing money from thin air without any gold backup. You deserve to live in a better world, live in harmony with nature, smiling faces everywhere, with inner happiness in your heart. That's what Flat Earth Awakening is all about. See you in the next episode. Feel free to give your thoughts on the polls. Should I make next episode in English with Indonesian subtitle like this? Or in Indonesian with English subtitle? Or just in Indonesian without English translation? Thanks for watching this channel. This is John Connor. And the world